Um, there's a new, there's a Bible out that somebody translated. Left out First John eight and nine. Yep. Left out First John eight and nine. I saw a copy. I saw the. I saw a picture of the page. They they they're leaving out First John eight and nine. Now all the people who, who say First John one nine doesn't belong to the church are using that as their. their there you go. It's right there. This guy's a scholar. He knows better than you know a millennia of biblical scholar uh, interpretation and and study. This one this one translation is now the basis for saying First John one nine doesn't belong to the church. You know, stop looking for ways to prove you are right. And let the Bible always judge and correct you. The Bible, the Word of God says that the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing the sun of the soul from the spirit, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It is imperative you approach the Word of God open for it to change you, not you come to it trying to make it fit you. Amen. The Word of God should be, a, should be the tool by which you are changed and transformed. Amen. How do you transform? I don't, be, not, uh, uh, um, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Amen. We have to let God's Word change us and stop trying to make it fit what we want, our, our preconceived ideas. Why? Because as soon as you put on those glasses, you skew the entire biblical. You know what? The Holy Spirit's your teacher. You should approach the Word of God. Teacher, teach me today. As I read the Word, teach me today. Things I haven't seen. Things I haven't seen properly. Teach me today. Let the Spirit of God in you guide you and direct you and teach you in Jesus' name. Amen? All right, Children's Church Preschool, you guys are dismissed. Youth Church tonight at 7, 6.30. Prayer tonight at 6.30. Come on out and join us uh, as we pray out some things in the Spirit. Hallelujah. The more the church is involved, the, 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 the better we, we can get some places. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, we're going to come. We're going to have the lights out. And we're going to pray in tongues. Yeah, we're praying in tongues with a purpose. Yes. We've got a purpose. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We'll open your Bibles, if you will, to Acts the 10th chapter. We have been for some time now talking on the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we've been interrupted a few times by the Holy Ghost in, in what we were going to preach on for that particular service. But uh, we are still starting here every Sunday until he tells us to stop starting here. Amen. Y'all here, you going home. How many are here? All right, 45% of you are here. The rest of you, would you please show up? Now, how many are here? Oh, there we go. We got 70%. Ben's still not here. Okay, Ben, are you going to get here today? Okay, all right. Glad to know it. Hallelujah. Praise God. We're going to talk about now um, the benefits. Remember the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, and, and one of the... Hold on. Zip. Rewind. <laughs> Hallelujah. I make a funny noise. I sat down Saturday morning. I was just like, you know, I want to do some veg out television time. I watch Looney Tunes and the Roadrunner Coyote shows for about an hour and a half. And I thought, that's just good television. Me, me. I thought I thought I'll put it that. I did. I did see a put it that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. We're going to talk about benefits of praying in tongues. Amen. Amen. You know, uh, it's amazing how much, how many wars were fought and are still fought over the subject of speaking in tongues. Um, and we, we need to take a step back and let's be honest. Is it a biblical practice or is it a biblical experience or not? Number one. Is it not? No. Not is it for today. Not is it, did it pass away? Is it a biblical experience? That's the first question. Did it happen in the Bible? Was it something that was of God in the Bible? Amen. It was. We, we've already covered that again, you know, but I just want to kind of reiterate that. We need, you know, uh, it's dangerous when we approach something and we get, to, you know, and you'll hear people say this, speaking in, speaking in tongues of the devil. It never was in the Bible. You didn't hear Paul say, stop, that's of the devil. Did you? Even when they got carried away and got into excess in the church, he said let things be done decently in order, but he never said speaking in tongues is of the devil. As a matter of fact, he got into one place that said, forbid no man to speak with tongues. That's right. Now I'll be honest with you. 
Anybody, I've seen Bible colleges, Christian Bible colleges, that have in their write-ups, if you are speaking tongues, this is not the college for you. Don't even bother applying. Hello. Now, my question is, how do you deal with Paul writing to the church and saying, forbid no man to speak in tongues? Hello? How do you do that? I'm waiting for an answer. How? You know, I got an answer to that one? Well, it passed away. Now, I don't have anywhere in the Bible that says tongues passed away. He did say in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that when certain things happen, they will pass away. But everybody says it's canonized of scripture, but you study, study out. It's, it's, it's not that. It's when Jesus returns. We don't need tongues in heaven. You don't need the word of knowledge in heaven. You don't need the gifts of the Spirit per se in heaven. Are you here? Are, are y'all gone home? Amen. So, uh, tongues is a biblical experience. Now, those who purport that it's passed away have no scriptural evidence. They try to look at a couple of obscure scriptures and make them say something. Again, trying to make it say what their preconceived idea is, and you can make anything fit. I can prove to you today that you are supposed to commit suicide and do it right now. By taking certain passages of scripture out of their setting, out of context, putting my own spin on them and putting them together. Judas went out and hanged himself. Go and do thou likewise. And what thou doest, do quickly. <laughs> Hello? Every last word I just spoke is Bible. Is it not? I just, now, now listen, it would be, it would be, you're talking about supernatural church decline. <laughs> Hello? Y'all hear you gone home. See, when we take the Bible out of its setting, we take things and try to make it fit something we want, we get into trouble. Yep. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> so, Judas went and hanged himself. Go and do thou likewise. What thou doest do quickly are all passages, uh, passages of Scripture taken out of their context, taken out of the parameters of the, the, the contextual meaning of each one of those verses put together. I just gave you Bible for committing suicide and doing it right now. Yep. Do it quickly. <laughs> Hello. Well, that's, that, that's not right. That's not rightly divine. The word of truth. That's exactly right. And that is my point. We must rightly divide the word of truth in the weight of all Scripture. Hello. You have to take. And so, when we come to the subject of tongues, Paul spent a lot of time. To, you know, one person went. They said, they said this. Paul said he'd rather speak five words with his understanding, ten thousand words in tongues. Paul did not believe in speaking tongues. Yet they leave out the other part down further on, where he says, "I thank my God I speak in tongues more." Than, or actually, said that before this. I thank my God I speak in tongues more than y'all. What did they do? They took something out of its setting, out of context, and then tried to make it that Paul said speaking in tongues wasn't important. Yeah. No, he made that in, 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 an uh, in, in an antithesis to the statement, I thank my God I speak in tongues more than y'all, but in the church, in order to minister and to help people, I'd rather speak in their language. Amen. Okay, so let's say this. Let's all come to this. I, I believe we can. If you go back and listen to all of our teaching on this, you'd have to be honest. Number one, speaking in tongues is a Bible experience. There is no scripture that says tongues stopped. As a matter of fact, when we look at 1 Corinthians, we covered this earlier, but I need to do it because, we're, because of the particular passage we're on. Look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 real quick, and then we're going to get on from there. Hallelujah. But look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He says here, after talking about love for eight verses, in verse 8 says, love never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. Now listen, he did not say we speak in tongues in part. Did he? But when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. Now stop. The one thing he didn't say was in part is the one everybody comes along and says that which is in part shall be done away, tongues were done away with. Have you ever heard them? Yeah. They teach it, they teach that verse, when that which is in parts done away, you know, when that which is perfect come, that which is in parts to be done away, tongues have been done away with. And it's the one thing of the three things he talked about in that previous verse that he did not say was in part. He said knowledge and uh, whatever the other one was. Prophecies. He said prophecies were in part and knowledge is in part 
And then he, and then he, but he did not say. He said tongues would cease. He said knowledge would vanish. Prophecies would cease. Amen. Are you here? Actually, he said prophecies will fail. Uh, tongues, will, tongues will cease and knowledge will vanish away. Well, it can't be talking about natural things. Amen. But he, then he says this, we know in part, knowledge. We prophesy in part. And that which is perfect has come, that which is in part shall be done away. He didn't say anything about tongues being in part. So here we go. I want to I present this to you. Their whole argument is flawed because they're, saying they're not even consistent in their argument. When they say that. That's an inconsistency in the argument. Okay? And I'm saying this because we've already agreed that speaking in tongues was a biblical experience. Amen. We also find no scripture that says speaking in tongues for the believer stopped. Hello. Two things that are, that are usually stated is number one, the last apostle died. And we don't even have a scripture about anything doing with the last apostles dying. There's nothing. And then second is when we got the Canonasia scripture. That's what Paul was talking about being perfect is coming. Now I'm going to say something here to discount a biblical experience and to preach in direct contradiction to a written scripture. Forbid no man to speak in tongues. Based on a stretch of interpretation of a passage of scripture that's vague at best on what you're trying to make it say is dangerous ground. Mm -hmm. Because you could do that with anything in the Bible and come up with all kinds of stuff. Who's to say the salvation didn't pass away when we got the Canonasia scripture? Hello? Nobody gets born again anymore. So we, got the, we got the written word. They had to live out a written word and live it out and try to make the best they can. Now, you can't misconstrue the Bible. And especially when there's, a, when there's a... Isn't it funny that of the, of the things that God said forbid no man to do? He said to forbid them not to speak in tongues. He didn't say don't forbid them to prophesy. He didn't say don't forbid them to, to lay hands on the sick. He didn't say don't forbid them to do... He said forbid no man to speak with tongues. Why? God... One guy said God sits at a time is like a wheel, wagon wheel with spokes. And God sits in the middle at the hub and he can look anywhere in time at any point he wants to. He can look back. He can look present. He can look future. He can see it all because he's outside of time. And he looked down here uh, 1,500, 600, 700 years later and saw boneheads going, speaking in tongues of the devil. And so he had the writer put in there, forbid no man to speak in tongues. Oh, I'm going to have to put this in there because there's an idiot up there somewhere in the future. And he probably wouldn't call him an idiot. He would call them one of my dear children who have not learned the, what my word says. Bless their darling heart and stupid heads. <laughs> Hallelujah. Y'all here, you're going home. So if it is a biblical experience, there is no scriptural evidence that it has ceased. We, we've covered the passages earlier in this teaching of when they were filled with the, when they were born again, when they were filled with the Spirit, they spoke in tongues. We've covered the five incidences where they were filled with the Spirit. Three of them directly state they spoke with tongues. The fourth one was the Apostle Paul, and yet we know he said he spoke in tongues more than everybody. Hello. And then the fifth one was when Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ. And Simon the sorcerer wanted to offer money, and it's inferred in that passage. And we, we've, we've covered that in previous teachings. So, there, so here we go. It's a biblical experience. We have five passages of Scripture that either directly state or infer that when they got filled with the Holy Ghost, they spoke with tongues. We've also got Scripture that proves that it's a separate experience from being born again. How do you know? The Acts chapter 5 makes it really clear. Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ. The people giving heed to him, both hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Amen. And so much as the lame, the halt, and the uh, palsy were made whole. Amen. And when Jerusalem heard that Samaria received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they would come down, might lay hands on them. They might receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen on none of them. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They'd already been water baptized. They'd already been saved. They'd been saved and water baptized. Peter and John came down and laid hands on them to get them filled with the Holy Ghost. Hello? Y'all hear you going home. The Bible says that before they ever get down there, they believed the word which Philip preached. 
They're born again. They've been water baptized. We can turn that air conditioner back off. Hallelujah. That's not, that's not real good for television. This, this is internet stuff. We love the people out there, but you know, we got to deal with stuff here. Turn the air conditioning off. <laughs> turn yours on at home if you want it on. I don't care. <laughs> Do not get up and go turn your thermostat, you know, just because that sits up. <laughs> Praise God. What are the bit now? Listen, it's a biblical experience. There's no evidence that it ever stopped. It's biblical evidence that when people get filled with the Holy Ghost, they speak in tongues. Now, let's get past that and go to the benefits of praying in tongues. Amen. We spend so much time discussing and arguing the case that people should be filled with the Spirit speaking in tongues that we forget to go on to the benefits oftentimes and get caught up in that because that's because there's so much opposition to it that we don't get people taught on some of the benefits. Amen. Look over in Acts 10 46. Hallelujah. I left Acts 10 46 because I ran into 1 Corinthians and you should have too because I told you to. Well, back at verse 44, when Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them that heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. That's the Jews. As many as came with Peter, because on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Speaking in tongues will cause you to magnify God. Amen. Oh, it's good to magnify God, isn't it? It's good to make God bigger in your life. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, you can look at your circumstances. You can look at your pile of bills. You can look at your lack of money. You can look at what your kids are doing, what your husband's doing, what your wife's doing, what the dog is doing. Hello. You can look at what's happening in the, in, in the realm of politics. You can look all around you. You get to talk about all that, meditating on all that, thinking all that, it'll get big. You'll magnify it. Oh, but when you begin to pray in those tongues, hallelujah, from heaven, glory to God, I'm telling you, the inner man begins to release and to commune, hallelujah. You begin to magnify God, hallelujah. I'm telling you, it just builds you up and you magnify the Lord and he gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Amen. It's good to have a big God. Yes. Now, you see, God is big. But people oftentimes reduce his size in their thinking. And it is your thinking and your mindset in relationship toward God as to how big God will be in your own life. <coughs> in, in thinking about magnifying, look with me, if, if you will, over to Numbers. I believe Numbers, the 13th chapter. Verse 26, and we know that they had chose out spies from each tribe, and they sent them into the land to spy out the land. Hallelujah. You know, they're going over. They've been, and listen, can, people, let me tell you, you can be a faith giant one day and a weenie the next. Come on now. You can be talking faith one minute, hallelujah. I mean, you listen to T.D. Jakes sweat all over the place, hallelujah. And just that. I mean, and you know, some preachers just got you all hyped and stirred and, I mean, fired up. Go with the gut. Faith try it today. We need tomorrow. See, the cons inconsistency as a believer. Consistency in your faith walk. And that's why you've got to constantly renew your mind. And that's, let me tell you something. Be ye being filled with the Spirit. We're going to get that one later. But I tell you, you've got to stay full of the Holy Ghost. Why? It keeps you magnifying God. I mean, the children of Israel watched God bring the, bring the plagues on Egypt and deliver them with a strong hand and bring them out. With the, now, listen, I know you, everybody, I love the Ten Commandments by Cecil B. DeMille or Cecil B. DeMille or however you want to say it. All right? CBD. M. Great movie. Scripturally inaccurate. Yeah. They got blind folk coming out, lame folk coming out. The Bible says there was no feeble one among them. Psalm 105. Is it Psalm 105 verse 35? Something like that. 119 verse 135? Something like that. It says there was no feeble one among their tribes. They, won't, they didn't carry anybody on stretchers. They didn't have blind folk coming out. They all came out whole and healed. Why? Because they had the lamb in them and the blood over them. Praise God. See, we got the lamb in us. Ooh, that's a sermon. Hallelujah. And the blood over us. The lamb in us and the blood over us. Amen. Are y'all here? You gone home? 
Glory to God. I said, glory to God. They watched God bring the plagues. They watched God deliver them with a strong arm. They came out with all the wealth. Hallelujah. And they were going on their way by the power of God. Singing about going into the promised land. Oh, we're going into the promised land. Came out of Egypt, coming into Canaan land. Glory to God. A land that surely floweth with milk and honey. They weren't going to have to use artificial means of irrigation. God said that it drank up the water there. I'm telling you, the, the hills and the valleys, it just it was abundantly taking care of itself. They didn't have to do all that work. God was bringing them into the place where there was a rest from their efforts and their labors. Praise God. To walk in his blessings. Glory to God. I said glory to God. <laughs> Amen. And they got up to a, you know, and, and listen. They, and they've already experienced Pharaoh chasing them down, getting pinned between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army, and God splitting it, congealing the waters, froze them, bless God. They walked over on dry ground, and then he drowned the whole Egyptian army in that water. Praise God. And one theologian said it was no big deal that they crossed over there. It was only six inches deep. Woo! Glory to God drowned the whole army in six inches of water. Horses and all. See, we win either way. Your dumb theological statement, it was no big deal, it was only six inches deep. Man, that's a bigger miracle. Drown, you drown a, a, a trained army and their horses in six inches of water, that's a bigger miracle. Amen. Amen. No, it was just like I said, he split the waters, they stood up on, on right hand, left hand, they walked over on dry ground, and then he drowned. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider are thrown into the sea. Hallelujah. That's what that's not Miriam's song. The horse and the rider are thrown into the sea. He drowned their armies and their horses and everything right there in the ocean. In the Dead Sea, Red Sea, Dead Sea, Red Sea, Sea of Reeds. Hallelujah. They crossed over on the other side. They saw all that. Get up to Canaan, about to go in. What happens? So they went out and searched the land from the wilderness of Zen to Rehob as the men came to Hamath. And down in verse uh, 25, and they returned from searching the land after 40 days. Talking about magnifying God. What happens when you don't magnify God? And they went and came to Moses and Aaron to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Remember, they got a cluster of grapes they had to put it on a staff and put between two men to bring it out. I go to the grocery store all the time. I drive up. I've yet to see anybody have two bag boys walking out with a cluster of grapes taken to somebody's car on a staff. In all, my, in all the years of my life, I've never seen that. Now, Mr. C., you're older than anybody in here. You seen that before? No. Think you'll ever see that? No. Why? Because it was, it, was, it was a supernatural blessing on the land. God in preparation bringing the children of Israel in. Yeah. And they, had, they, they brought the fruit. And they told them. And they, and they told him and said, We come into the land whither thou sinnest. And surely... It flow with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Oh, stop. I mean, if they just shut up right then. Just like God said. Man, these are faith people. Glory to God. Been brought out by the 12, the 10 plagues. Been brought out by walking across on dry ground. <coughs> God's been supernaturally blessing God there. And then here they come out. Oh, and then you've got to expect the excitement in people. Oh, the land flows with milk and honey. Look at them grapes, baby. I'm telling you, we're going to have some great juice for years. Woo! That's just the grapes. What else are there? Nevertheless, you need to stop looking for reasons you can't and just stop with what God said. Yes. Nevertheless, the people be strong. Well, so what? The same God that brought ten plagues on Egypt and brought you out, the same God that split the Red Sea and brought you over on dry ground and drowned the whole army behind you and Miriam got up and danced sang a new song. It's the same God that brought you here. He knew you were going to go to a land. He had those inhabitants there while you were in captivity, tending and tilling and taking care of the land. They were temporary tenant farmers. Hello? They, why? Because he, did, because he didn't want the land to lay in waste. Didn't want, you, know, you ever see something, <coughs> something, something laying in waste? 
Go look at a parking lot of a, of a business that's been out of business for some time. Yeah. Now look at the parking lot of the business right next to them that's in business. <laughs> the, bus the parking lot with no business, the asphalt will crack. Mm -hmm. Grass will start growing up through it. It'll start busting the concrete up. I mean, tree, tree ceilings getting holes and start growing trees and just tearing the concrete. Or, uh, conc you think concrete's tough? It can't handle, it can't handle a tree root. Okay. As tough as concrete is, you get a tree under it, it'll bust it up. Yeah. Yep. Over time. Now, it might not do it in a week. It might not do it in two weeks. But you give it two, three years of, of no attention, it'll bust it up. You ever buy people's houses, they got a big old tree there, and the concrete's raised up and cracked in half and all this kind of stuff. What happened? And that, tree, that root just was going to do what it's going to do. Hello? So you let the land lie fallow. You let, it lie, you let it lie unattended for a long period of time, and it'll become desolate. It'll become waste. It'll be over, it's overtaken by all the wrong. It'll take years to fix it. Yeah. God had tenants there watching the land until his people got there. Hallelujah. Built houses, built cities, had groves, had all the stuff set up. I mean, it was turnkey operation. Yeah. Hallelujah. Y'all with me? Y'all going home? Yeah. Turnkey is for me. I mean, I like doing construction stuff, but I'm honest with you. When it comes to building a house or, or, or building the church or whatever, I don't have to go and do, you know, 10 weeks worth of work. I want to get handed the key and walk in and go, let's have church. Yeah. Amen. Let's get after it. Amen. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. The cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hethites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast. Bad report. God said something, but nevertheless, God said, by his stripes ye were healed. Nevertheless, the doctor said, you got to die. Hello? We just had a friend send us a um, text message uh, last Sunday, actually last Sunday morning before we preached, and said, pray, my husband's, one of my husband's employees who's a minister, his son has been rushed to the hospital, suffering with, and they started, they said, they said numerous infections, and he has, has, has dealt with, dealing with Crohn's disease, and he lost so much blood, they're not expecting him to live. So they're expecting him to die. Well, we prayed. And commanded the blood to stop flowing in Jesus' name. Commanded him to be made whole from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. That he was the healed of the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And, amen. And he'll live and not die in Jesus' name. We got a text about later on. Blood, uh, uh, bleeding has stopped. He's stable. Continued to pray. And I sent back, thank God we got inside information. I didn't say, I'm going to continue to pray. Jesus is the healer. And he is healed from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. And then I sit back right after that. I sent another one in and said, um, he that began a good work in him will complete it. Amen. I don't pray for God to begin something and not finish it. Amen. Uh, when I ask God to do something, I don't say now, will you complete what you started? No, I pray when he begins, I'm expecting him to finish it. Amen. So I said, well, he, and you know, we got, we got a text uh, yesterday or Friday, late Friday or yesterday morning. I forget which one it was. Going home, yeah, it was Friday, because he was going home Saturday. Not one single one of the infections they thought he had, he had. Now, they're, they're, they're treating him for Crohn's, but they said he's a miracle because he, he, they, he was supposed to be dead. So you can't, you can't go, nevertheless, the doctor said he's going to die. You got to learn to take your stand and magnify God. Well, see, for the New Testament believer, we gotta, we've got an empower house inside of us where we can commune with the Father and build ourselves up and pray in other tongues and magnify God. Listen, Caleb goes, st Caleb stilled the people and said, let us go up at once and possess it for we are well able. Why are we well able? Our God, he is God. We are well able to overcome it, but the men that went up with him, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Think about that. When you start talking about your problems being bigger 
than what you can deal with. When, you're, when your situation is greater than you and all you can talk about is how bad it is and you're doing your own personal audition for the remake of Hee Haw, gloom, despair, agony on me, deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I had no luck at all. That's what your song is. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Deep, dark depression and excessive misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. And then they all go, oh, my wife went off with the milk. I mean, they used to come up with some stupid stuff after. <laughs> y'all remember, remember that's all he all. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> when you're singing, when you're singing the, the shoulda, coulda, wouldas. When you're talking about you got the blues. When you're talking about how bad it is, what are you doing? You're magnifying the circumstances above the one who can bring you out. And listen to verse 32. And they brought up an evil report. Hold your place right there. Run over to the book of Isaiah. Chapter 53, verse 1. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? We got a song. Whose report will you believe? We will believe the report of the Lord. Whose report will you believe? We will believe the report of the Lord. His report says, I am healed. His report says, I am filled. His report says, I am free. His report says, victory. Now here, they brought up an evil report. And what happened when they brought up an evil report? Said so they searched the land, the land which we have gone through to search it, the land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof and all the people we saw were men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, and come with the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Now stop. You want to give the devil heyday in your life? Magnify his deeds. You want to let, you want to let the devil run rush out over you? Talk about how big he is. You want to have it rough and tough? Talk about the devil and everything he's doing. Yeah. Oh, I've, I've got news for you, my brother and sister. You don't have to live there. You can live in a different place. You can live in a place where God is magnified above all else. Oh, but pastor, my mind's just going squirrely. There's so many things going on. Oh, but thank God that there has been a gift given unto the believer from heaven above called the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Glory to God, where we can speak in tongues and begin to build and begin to magnify God. Hallelujah. Out of our spirits, praise God, and lift him up and, and, and set him on the throne high above all else glory to God and even in the midst of despair even in the midst when your mind is going bozo squirrely you can stop and go yeah, my head ain't getting nothing now but my spirit is my spirit is communing with God. My spirit's magnifying God. Hallelujah. And the inner man is getting strengthened. Hallelujah. Praise God. And the more God gets magnified, the smaller the problem gets. Hallelujah. Thank God we can magnify God praying in other tongues. Oh, he gets bigger. He gets bigger than the problem. Well, Pastor Ed, I walked out of that place of prayer and I still had the two stacks sitting on the table. Yeah, but you're looking at them different. <coughs> Hallelujah. You can have a car. You might think it's a piece of junk. The guy who next gets it thinks it's, 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 it's a Cadillac. Are you here? You wouldn't trade your car and it was old and kind of worn out. It had 175,000 miles on it. And someone bought it off the used car lot somewhere. And they're thinking, thank God I got this car. It's on how you look at it. I said it's all on how you look at it. To one man it's a piece of junk. To another man it's a castle. 
Hello? Y'all here? Y'all going home? Some people walk into a 1,200 square foot house and go, my God, my closet's is bigger than this. Others walk in and think, look how big this house is. It's your perspective. And the believer has to consistently magnify God so that everything they look at, they look through the magnification of God is with me. And if God be for me, who can be against me? Amen. Oh my glory to God. Isn't it good to know? I, I, I love using this. We got inside information. Dad Hagen tells a story one time they had relatives trying to, uh, they were working to rob his mother of his, her inheritance when somebody died. And uh, he went in and they thought he was going to have a fight or they were going to have a big fight or whatever. And couldn't send Dub over because Dub would have beat him up. Now Brother Hagen's brother Dub used to run with Bonnie and Clyde. I sat at that sit and did it with them one time and he told some of the stories. You know, he, he was, he was a, <laughs> he was running with some pretty serious gangsters. <laughs> I mean, people don't know what gangsters are today. Not compared to them kind of people. They, they feel that, I mean, if he had gotten out of that gang and got away, he, he would have been one of the people that fell with the bullet holes in him. Yeah. <clears throat> Are y'all here? You're going home. Oh, anyway. They couldn't send Dove, but their Dove would whoop them. He, he said, no, I'll go, I'll go. And he got around one of the relatives, the, the ringleader. He, they said, he said, that somebody's going to try to steal your mama's money. He said, that's all right. I got inside information. Oh, you do? He said, yeah, I got some inside information. Everything's going to be fine. That guy made sure, he thought he had something on him. That guy made sure everything would happen just the way it was supposed to happen. <laughs> we can use that on the devil. I got inside information. Yeah. Jesus is Lord. God is exalted. Hallelujah. My God is bigger than my circumstance. That's what I told that girl last week when she texted a friend of Jamie, Jamie Nowers. When she texted us about this young fellow and texted back, I said, isn't it good to know we got inside information? Hallelujah. The doctors are saying one thing, but Jesus says another. Glory to God. And when you magnify God, the bills say one thing. The banks say one thing. The doctors say one thing. But we got inside information, my brother and sister. Glory to God. Keep going. God magnified, hallelujah, by praying in tongues. <coughs> Understand this. There's going to be times your head can't get it figured out and can't wrap around and can't come up with a solution. Well, God gave us a brain. Yeah, but when your brain can't figure it out, thank God. When you run to the end of you. How many of you ever, ever run to the end of you? Oh, yeah. I've been at the end of me before. Nothing you can do. Amen? Somebody said, Sister Hagen told Brother Hagen one time, he said, on the front porch step, <clears throat> he's holding one of the children, I think uh, Pastor Hagen now, but, you know, Ken, and she was holding um, um, Pat. And something happened, and she said, I don't think you'd worry if me and both youngest fell dead right here on the front doorsteps. He said, certainly not. Be no use in worrying then. <laughs> <laughs> they go over real good at the point in time, but <laughs> why well, start worrying then? Amen. We've got to get over that. We've got to learn to magnify God. And I'll tell you, what do you do? When, I tell, when your head's going, oh my God, what am I going to do? How am I going to just stop? Get a hold of yourself and say, and God will start getting bigger. I said, God will get bigger. Amen. And you'll get in communication, which leads us to our next point. Um, you know, praying in tongues gives you divine communication with the Father of Spirits. Spirit to spirit. Now, the beautiful thing is Satan don't know what you're saying. That means you get it. You, you got a, what's, um, <coughs> it's like a virtual private network. You get out on the internet, you can go home. I can go home and I can get in communication with my office here. But other people can't get in, get in communication with it. They can't find out what I'm doing, don't know what I'm saying. I can communicate and do, and do business. And I do a lot of my office work at home just because it's, it's, it's foolish for me to come down here and run the air conditions and the lights and all that stuff when I, I, I can do it at home and do the same work right there. You know? You know, and if I meet somebody, I'll come down here and meet you here. You know, counsel here, do whatever. And if we have more staff members, I'd be here more. We don't. So I do most of it at home. And just log in. Tunnel in. And commune with my computer computer to computer and we have our own language we have our own protocol and nobody nobody can see what we're doing 
They may know what's going on, but they can't see what's going on. And you see, praying in tongues is the same way with you and the Father. You're logging into his spirit with your spirit. And you got your own protocol. And you're got communing. May, people may hear what you're doing, but they don't know what you're doing or saying. <clears throat> it's encrypted. Thank you, Brother Bill. And Satan doesn't have the key. He is a walking virus. Okay. But there is a, but Norton Utilities has nothing on the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Amen? Now, sometimes I wonder if Norton Utilities is behind all the viruses. Anyway, that's, that's, that's speculation. I'm not saying they are. I'm not demeaning their character. I just, you know, just speculating. You know, out, verbally, out, out loud. Just an observation of the feasibility and possibility study of that actually being the truth. <clears throat> and moving right along. You have an encrypted communication with God that your spirit and his spirit understand. And the beautiful thing is, I could take something from my computer, bring it down and encrypt it to mine, and unlock it. Or whatever, what I'm using, and see what I brought. And see, when you pray in tongues, in your communication with God, the spirit of man is a candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Revelation or unzipping the file takes place with you. And you don't, you don't have to verbalize it. The devil still doesn't know what it is. I'm telling you that we can have. So we'll look at First Corinthians chapter 14. We're looking at verse uh, 1. Follow after love and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, how be it in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. You can commune with the Father of Spirits and mysteries. Oh, I'm telling you, when you begin to pray in tongues and commune with the Father, you're not, to, you're not doing it for men. You're not doing it to edify. If I pray in tongues, I'm not going to edify uh, Greg at all. Mm -hmm. He can sit here all sorts, listen to me speak in tongues, might go, well, pastor's getting blessed and won't get doodly squat. <laughs> oh, but I'm getting blessed. Because I'm in communion with the Father of Spirit. See, this is one of the benefits of praying in tongues. I get in direct divine communication with God. Let me say this. Because it's bypassing the suke, the soul, I don't misinterpret or misconstrue what's taking place. There's purity in it. Now, let me, let me share this with you. Um, the other day, Friday, when we got the text message about the guy who had, um, that we had prayed for and everything, I, I turned to Janie, I said, because I, I, I saw it, it was in two, and I, and I didn't read, I, I had stopped, I stopped, like, looked down real quick, light like, turned, so I put it down, and all I saw was, he died. Ah. Or, he, you know, I saw something that said, you know, update on him, and then I saw, died. And I went, honey, the, the guy we prayed for died. She said, what? I said, yeah. And then she picked it up and she said, the doctor said it's a miracle <laughs> because he almost died. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Y'all hear you go home. See, I saw just a little bit. And see, listen, I'm going to tell you something. A lot of times, because your mind, your mind's funny. We, we all did this by, how many remember the little game you played in elementary school? You'd whisper something in Janice's ear. She'd whisper it in Jerry's. He'd go to Jesse, Miss C, Mr. C, Karen, you know, Joe, Matthew, Scotty, Montreal, back down to Neen, Brian, Schubert's, Curry's, and I'm going to stop there. I can go through the whole church. Okay? I know y'all's names. All right. Go through the whole church. Get over here to Benny and Benny and get up and say, now what did, they, what, did they, what did they say? And it ain't even close to how it started out. I'm telling you, there are times when we are, we are in, in, in difficult situations and stress. We're distracted and we're trying to get answers from heaven and we're not hearing the whole thing. We may have heard part of it, but we didn't hear the whole thing. 
And because we didn't get the whole thing, we misinterpreted what was said. Just like when I looked at that text message and didn't see the whole thing, I thought, man, he died. I know we prayed. I know we, I mean, I'm, th I'm here thinking all this stuff. I know we were in faith. I know I had the Holy Ghost on that. He died. Janie picks it up and reads, it and reads the whole thing. The doctor says, it's a miracle because he almost died. Now he's going home. Oh, I really messed that up. <laughs> Hallelujah, we had a resurrection and been raised from the dead in five seconds while we're talking. Hallelujah. That's why praying in tongues, oh, praise God. Hallelujah. Your head doesn't get in the way and, and have those, those, uh, those, whatever they have, brain cramps. Well, I'm going to use that. Brain cramps, brain freeze. Hello? But your spirit gets it straight from the Father. No mess up communication. No trying to think, you know, you were, you were thinking you heard God say something while you were praying and the television went off in the other room. Or somebody rang the doorbell. Or the phone rang. Or somebody walked in and gave you another bad report on top of all the other bad reports you already got. I'll tell you what, sometimes you got to tell people to shut up. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Just yeah. shut up. Right. Now, if you want to be nice, say, Femme la bouche. <laughs> Did that sound nice? Yeah. I shut up in French. <laughs> Still sounds pretty. You can tell people off in French and it sounds nice. Now, German, you can be nice to them and it sounds mean. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. Okay, what I do to you? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter how you say it, it still comes out. There, that's why one guy said there's no romantic love songs in German. Anyway. Praise God. <clears throat> but see, when, 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 you're not, when you're, you're not in communion with the Spirit, that's, I'm not saying we don't pray with our natural understanding. I, Paul said, I'll pray with the Spirit, I'll pray with the understanding. But I am telling you, there is something that, that is special. There is something unique about communing with the Father and the Spirit, Spirit to Spirit, that keeps, gets past the soul of man, and it's just Spirit to Spirit. It's purity. The clarity's better. It's like HD versus rabbit ears. I'm not talking about HD rabbit ears. I'm talking analog, fuzzy-wuzzy, aluminum foil hanging from them up against the metal screens of the house trying to pick up anything you can do. Standing there like this. Done it all. Yeah. Hung them out the window. You turn them every which way you can. Trying to get, get channel 7, 8, or 9. I mean, you know, three channels. We had three, 7, 9, and 12 down in Greenville is what we used to have. And then you had UHF channel PBS. Yep. And you had the round antenna for that. If you had one of them, you could get them. <clears throat> Praying in tongues is HD communication. 1080 HD. We're not even talking about 720. We're at 1080, baby. Y'all hear you going home. And the communion is clear, crystal clear, and perfect. Oh, praise God. Thank God we can have divine communication with the Father of Spirits. Thank God in the midst of the worst turmoil you could possibly be in, you can just, oh, Father, I need answers from heaven. And I don't know how to pray as I ought, but you sent the Holy Ghost. Oh, thank God for the Holy Ghost who takes hold with me together against my infirmities because I don't know how to pray as I ought. And so, Father, I just come to you right now. I need answers from heaven. See, these are benefits of praying in tongues. This is why, this is why the church world has been deceived by Satan in so many places to stop. Well, if the whole church world was filled with the Holy Ghost, praying in tongues and praying out these divine secrets, my God, what would we be doing for the kingdom of God? But Lord, I'm in such a tight place and out of my mind can't get all the answers. My mind is wearied. But I thank you for the Holy Ghost. He'll take hold with me in my time of prayer. Thank you, Father, for utterances where I commune with you. And I speak divine secrets. 
mysteries. Actually, the Greek, Greek says divine secrets. Mysteries, the King James says, divine secrets. Thank you, Father. My mind's been a basket case, but my spirit can commune with you. And as I begin to settle into the spirit. <laughs> oh, peace comes to my soul. And in my time of divine communication with you, peace overtakes me. And I come to a place, and I hear, I got to go to this one. Because praying in tongues brings you into rest. Isaiah 28, 11 says, with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye shall cause, or you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. 1 Corinthians 14, 21 says, in the law it is written. What's in the middle of talking about in 1 Corinthians 14? Speaking in tongues. I'm going to go over there and maybe look around and see if there's something else around that I want to say. 1 Corinthians 14. In the law it is written with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people. And yet for all this they will not hear, saith Lord, wherefore tongues are a sign. He's saying that the other tongues, is he's talking about verse 21 is in reference to tongues. But in Isaiah, he said that tongue, he says this, this other tongues and stammering lips is the rest You'll cause the weary to rest in. Oh, hallelujah. If you've been wearied. The Bible talks about becoming wearied and faint in your soul, faint in your minds. And you begin to lose the battles because your mind gets wearied. Oh, hallelujah. But we don't have to stay there. <laughs> oh, we don't have to live there. We can pull ourselves aside and say, Lord, you said this is the rest wherewith you'll cause the weary to rest. And you may not feel a thing. You might feel like I'm dry. Are y'all here? You may be going, how dry I am. Oh, my. I better stop that song. <laughs> we don't want to be looking for the bathroom key. Hallelujah. <laughs> the kids version <laughs> how dry I am how wet I'll be if I don't find the bathroom key remember kids just mess up songs all the time oh my but right in the middle of the worst places where your mind your soul are just scrambled eggs as far as the ability to function yeah, but you, I know you've been there you've been there where you just can't get your thoughts to get together yeah. To analyze, to do anything because the pressure is so great, the problems are so great, the circumstances are so great. But this is the rest. <laughs> oh, this is the rest. Like that old song. There is a river that flows from deep. Within there is a fountain that frees the soul from sin. Come to this water, there is a vast supply, for there is a river. That never will run dry. Oh. He that believeth on me, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Hallelujah. But this spake he of the Spirit, for as yet he was not given. Hallelujah. Yeah. There is a river. It flows from deep within. There is a 
fountain that frees the soul from sin. Hallelujah. There is a river. I got, I got messed up. I got, but there's a river. Te amo, say la la moni. I'm telling you, my church. Oh, thank God for the Holy Ghost. You are not left helpless. I will send another after the same manner of myself. I will send another paracletos. Hallelujah. That he may be with you. I'll not leave you comfortless. Intercessorless. Advocateless. Teacherless. Standbyless. Strengthenedless. I'll send you another advocate. Helper. Strengthener. Teacher. Intercessor. Advocate. Standby. Hallelujah. This is the rest. <laughs> this is the rest. Wherewith you shall cause the weary. The we he knew people would become wearied. He knew people would fight and have to deal with and face weariness. But he sent the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Woo! Glory to God. He sent the great and mighty comforter. Hallelujah. The Kerakalithos. Hallelujah. That he may abide with you forever. And in the middle of the turmoil, with stammering lips of another tongue, will I speak to this people. And this is the rest. This is the rest wherewith you'll cause the weary. Jesus said that the well have no need of the physician. The non-weary have no need of rest. In this, in this what I'm, how I'm talking here. God knew. Oh, hallelujah. God knew that people would be in a place that their soul would be, and, and, and understand how I'm saying this, their soul would be fractured, their suke would be so overcome by the stress, it couldn't gather itself. But he sent a gift into the earth. Oh, my, 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 my. And you got people fighting the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, and God sent it so that wearied people, not the only reason, one of the reasons, could enter into rest. And peace would overtake their soul. Comfort would come. And hours of turmoil. When you know, doctors give people drugs to deal with that stuff, they put them on drugs. People's minds are going, you know, they get, all, they get so out of whack, they can't. And, and I'm telling you, praying in tongues will get all the, get everything back in order. All the neurons firing right. Recalibrate everything in the brain. See, they try to do it with drugs. They try to inhibit things. They try to adjust the, everything in the brain with drugs. And I'm telling you, there is the Holy Ghost. And I hear the problem with the drugs is it suppresses so many other things. It makes you weird. You're, you're bound to that drug <clears throat> when the peace of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Anybody been blessed today? Oh, my, 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 my.